Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for taking the time to register to uh, attend this presentation. My name is Charles Nyabeze, and I'm the Vice President of Business Development and Commercialization with the Center for Excellence in Mining Innovation, SEMI. Uh, SEMI is a 14-year-old company based in Sudbury, Canada, that specializes in accelerating the commercialization of innovation into the global mining industry. Before we jump into the presentation, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and will be shared on SEMI's Mining Innovation YouTube channel. All guests will be placed on mute for the duration of the presentation, and all guests are welcome to ask questions via the chat box. So you can type your questions in the chat box. Uh, a recording of the presentation will be made available to uh, all participants this week. And uh, any questions that we happen to not answer during the call will be addressed post webinar. So let us move on to the reason why we're all here. Today is disclosure number 22 of technologies that SEMI has been able to identify out there. And today's disclosure is on an eco-friendly removal of heavy metals from the heavy metals industry. And this technology particularly removes heavy metals from industrial wastewater. This automated solution will harness the power of carbon electro technology to actively attract, immobilize, and filter, filter metals in a process that is really selective. I'd like to hand over the presentation to Cameron, Lep Cameron Lippert, CEO of Electromet. Cameron, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Thank you, Charles. Uh, and to the semi organization, it's absolutely fantastic what you guys were able to pull together and um, do for companies such as ours. And it's my privilege to be able to introduce Electromet uh, to the, the mining and metals industry in general. And as Charles mentioned, what we've developed is a new technology utilizing carbon electrodes and being able to use them to selectively target and remove metals from a variety of water streams. So I'm going to introduce this technology today. <clears throat> now, first, a little background on who we are. Uh, we are a, a young company uh, that spun out from the University of Kentucky back in 2014 around uh, my co-founder's research, James Landon, where we spent a lot of time working on how to tune carbon materials and use them in water purification devices. And what we are really building is we see this vision to utilize this platform technology to develop a portfolio of sustainable solutions to treat a wide variety of complex water challenges. And our first iteration, our first focus is on removing dissolved metals from these water streams. And we raised venture capital back in 2019 to uh, commercialize this technology and build towards achieving this goal. Now we have this grand vision of not just being able to remove the metals to meet discharge compliance, but we're setting the foundation to really be able to mine these various water streams for added resources and get the value add. So we want to re-engineer the way people traditionally think about water and wastewater. And instead of thinking of it as a burden, think of it as a potential value add, a potential resource to be utilized. Now, we're, typically we, we are focused on removing these metals from wastewater streams to be able to meet regulatory guidelines to discharge this water without harming the environment. But we do this in a way to where we can collect these metals in purified forms in, in either aqueous solutions or as metal solids. So we see this vision of being able to close the circular economy and take these traditionally wasteful, uh, toxic byproducts that are being used in the environment and turn them into a value-added resource and put them back into the economy. Now, this technology is broadly applicable to a wide variety of industries, which is kind of the major source of these metals in water streams. And this presentation today, this webinar is focused really on the mining industry, how it applies there, but also kind of tails into some of the adjacent metal fabrication industries, such as smelting. And we'll look at two different sort of tie-ins today. Uh, the first being looking at recovery. How can we recover these metals from these water streams and turn them into a value add product? And second, uh, being able to meet regulatory uh, environmental regulations so you can discharge this water safely into the environment or into the uh, municipal water streams. 
and specifically to the mining industry, uh, there's a wide variety of ways we can apply our technology to these operations, but I'm listing three here that appear to be uh, sort of the best fit and most valuable. Um, looking at you know, recovering some copper from say these pregnant lead solutions or some metals, being able to purify, uh, remove trace metal impurities from these gypsum saturated solutions, or even removing and recovering some metals from these acid mine drainage. Um, these tend to be you know, very large volumes of water. Uh, we talk about even having a small amount of trace metals in these large volumes, there's potential large uh, economic incentives to be able to do this. Additionally, you know, all these streams eventually will probably be you know, put down the drain somewhere or disposed of. So making sure that at the end of life, you know, the end of this water is pure enough, or clean enough to be able to, to send back into the environment. So looking at specifically you know, wet mines, where they're continuously having this water in, water out, at least to make sure that they are not gonna harm the environment. And also at the end of life of mines, these mine closures, when there's any sort of environmental cleanup that has to take place before the mine can be shut down, that this technology is uh, applicable there. Now, typically looking at how to recover metals, how do we remove the metals from discharge, there is a wide breadth of solutions out there that can achieve these targets. Um, I'm just showing three here that tend to be some of the most uh, well-known. And what we're looking at here is say, for example, the pregnant lead solution. Electrowinning is very good at recovering some copper, but it has limitations. It needs to technically be usually very clean, um, low impurities and very high concentrations. Once you get the looter copper streams, the economics just don't work as well. Whereas our electrical system works very well at these lower concentrations. So in tandem, you can have a total solution. Similar with ion exchange has this niche fit, but if you get very high concentrations and saturated quickly and the economic scale to be just uh, too expensive to be able to utilize. There's also problems with generating the resin beads, interferences with other ions that might uh, take up capacity. So yeah, niche applications of maybe some dilute streams, they might work well. Uh, and lastly, mainly looking at uh, for discharge compliance, right? Chemical coagulation is very good process to remove bulk metals from waters to just be able to dump down the, the water and release it, discharge it. Uh, but these are not very selective. So ion exchange and the coagulation, if you want to recover metals for value add, these are very difficult to do when you have complex matrices as seen in some of these mining waters. This is where we uh, developed the legend for. Again, we like to re-engineer the way we think about these streams. So utilizing our advanced carbon electro technology, we built this platform to be able to selectively and with high tunability, be able to target specific dissolved metals in these water streams, remove them while letting all the other stuff we don't want pass through. So we do this in a chemical free process. We don't use membranes. And the key factor in doing that is it removes a lot of the operation burden. So these can be deployed remotely. It's uh, remote accessible requires very little energy input. So that combined with the small footprint makes it very suitable for some of these uh, tough destinations. And one of the most vital things we've seen from current customers is we built this the ground up with IoT, with data analytics, machine learning in mind. So as it continues to do this process, it continuously learns, is able to improve and have uh, analytics from just the operation and longevity of our system, but also can tie back into the front end part of the process and start to tell you information from there. Now, how does it work? I'm just gonna go under briefly um, on these next few technical points, but the, the main highlight of what we do is we flow water through our carbon materials while applying a voltage. And the net effect is we take these dissolved metals, we convert them into insoluble species. For example, we can take copper, ions play as copper metal. Take lead, it becomes lead oxide. These are insoluble forms that have become filtered out inside of our carbon matrix and trapped, which we can then recover uh, at a later time. We do this through a variety of cascading mechanisms. The most prominent one is direct reactions on the electrode. So the direct use of voltage to change the state of the metal into the insoluble species. Because we use carbon electrodes, we also see localized pH changes, which can then do uh, you know, cascading chemistry, as well as producing a variety of mixed oxidants, such as hydrogen peroxide from any dissolved O2 in the water. 
So we have a net effect of direct electrochemical reactions, uh, physical adsorption chemistries on the carbon, as well as chemical reactions taking place to remove these metals and convert them into these insoluble species, which we can trap, filter, and recover later. And some of the operating principles is where we use these things called Porbe diagrams, which is really just the kind of a fancy word of saying a phase diagram of metal in water. To where on the X axis, we have the pH of the water stream, the Y, essentially the applied voltage we're using, what's the electricity we're using. And what we like are horizontal lines and diagonals, because we're going to change our voltage and be able to change states from, say, dissolved species of copper into a insoluble metal species. And same, similar for lead, we might be able to take this dissolved lead into acidic because we can modulate the pH on our electrode through the applied voltage and then increase it to be able to turn it into a lead oxide, which is now a solid filter out. So every metal species has one of these diagrams. And based on that, we can tune what voltage we need to do to target that specific metal. So here I'm showing just the periodic table and looking at what metals can we theoretically target versus what are we actually doing today with current installations and what are some of our tender projects we are in the works right now. So as you can see, we've got typically these standard metals we see in uh, mines and metal finishing type industries. And we got a few projects in the works looking at some of these more exotic, challenging ones. But theoretically, really any of these uh, D-block metals, some of these lanthanides, actinides, rare earth elements are all able to be targeted because we can convert them into insoluble species by using this effect of changing the voltage, changing the pH to find that sweet spot to convert into an insoluble form that we can filter, capture, and recover. And uh, as it relates to Canada, since that's where the semi is based, we can look at what's called these uh, critical minerals. So there's a broad list of minerals that the government has determined to be of high value for economic success. So we we're actually looking at these eight that we can do on the list. And theoretically, we can do about 18 on that list. So these will be of high value in the future as resources become strained, as the market becomes more demanding of these metals. So this is, again, a way to close that circuit economy to find new sources of these metals instead of having to do you know, new manufacturing processes, new mining processes. Where else can we get these value add? And water streams and wastewater streams in particular are of a huge potential value for these metals for the potential added revenue source. I'll dive a little deeper on what metals and kind of where we fit best. As I mentioned earlier, like electrolytic and copper, it's very good at high concentrations. Okay. Uh, where it starts to, to fail is when you get a little more and more dilute. So when you get into this sort of 2000 to 5000 ppm range of copper, the efficiency of electro winning um, goes off a cliff. Well, we don't have that cliff. We are very good down in the parts per billion range or up to the high PPM. When in the very high PPM range, the economics may not be as good as say electro winning, but once you get in the 2000 below, uh, it's extremely competitive. Um, because of our design, it's very fast reaction kinetics. It's very energy efficient. We don't have a lot of uh, sort of inefficiency of reactions taking in place. Our electrodes are very close together. They're very good at utilizing all the energy input to do the chemistries we want. And because of this, we can get very, very low uh, effluent qualities in, in our waters. So we can go down to the low, low parts per billions coming out of our system. Now for these copper triads, we're very good at getting these out of both acidic waters and more neutral to alkaline waters. Um, so we got a lot of versatility we can do for that one. For most other metals, we'd like to be in more of this neutral range to where it's already safe to discharge in the environment. Um, so the concentration is, is maybe the sweet spot is going to be in these you know ppm ranges to, to hundreds ppm. But the more metals you have in the water, the you know more expensive it gets, the more energy it's going to take. So there is a sweet spot to think about when you're removing low concentrations of metals for recovery versus discharge compliance. And then the vice versa for recovery and, you know, revenue add is, you know, what's a sweet spot in terms of uh, feed concentrations and economics. And the general process flow is, is very simple. Um, maybe pH adjustment if you need, depending on what metals you're looking at, uh, standard solid filtration, and then pass through our system. 
We don't need a lot of other pretreatment. We just don't want a lot of solids in there because solids will clog it. Uh, we become a very expensive particle filter. So it's better to have something up front. And once it passes through our system, that's when the end user, the client can decide of, is it just for discharge? Do you want to reuse that water? And then we have the option to essentially clean our Electromet filters and then we cover that metal in a variety of sites that is uh, you know, wherever the end recycler or user would want. It could be solid metal, powder, liquid solutions. Um, we had that facility. And how we typically engage with new clients, uh, depending on the water stream, we like to do some feasibility testing. So a small volume of water, a few gallons, we can test it in-house, uh, dial in on these operating parameters to get that selective removal that is the most efficient. <clears throat> we can then move forward to doing an on-site pilot demonstration we take one of these smaller systems, it's about the size of a home water softener, can process up to 20 gallons per minute, lease it so it can be used on site for one to two to three months, whatever is necessary for the client to be confident that it can reliably and consistently meet the removal and or recovery target needs of the client. And for us, this allows us to see how does it perform with the changing dynamic of the influent water. Because every day, it's rare that's the same water day to day. So as that water changes, we'd like to understand how it impacts our system and how the performance might need to be tuned so we can dial in the operation specific to that water. And it's a fully automated process. The client doesn't have to worry about it. Just as water comes in, we can track those parameters. It changes it to make sure you consistently meet your effluent targets. Second, this tells us what is the lifetime of these cartridges and how often do they need to be replaced. And that is going to be the bulk of the operational cost. So as they are consumed, they have to be thrown away. And that's the basis to scale up into a full-scale system. And it's modular, so we can start small and easily scale from you know, a few gallons per minute up to millions of gallons per day. We just tack on more modules. Now I'll finish up and just give some brief highlights of some of the applications we've dealt with and some of the value we've seen. And uh, we will do another webinar in, in a few weeks where we dive into the details of these types of streams. So here I'm showing examples of both uh, uh, copper mine tailings for recovery, as well as some uh, zinc smelting, looking at some of the waste and trying to recover copper from that waste. So as you see in the mining, it's pretty complicated water stream here on the right, where they only had a small percent copper and a lot of other stuff. We were able to remove that copper very selectively and get it in high purity without having to do any of the anachemistries. So it ended up being a very economical process to recover this, this copper that uh, I don't think anything else could really do. It's too dilute for electro winning. It's too complicated for ion exchange. Chemical-based processes will give everything out. Similar for some of these uh, smelting processes, we have you know, gypsum saturated. It's very, very saturated in these zinc salts. Um, we're still able to tile it in and target that copper very selectively and economically, given the spot prices of copper. Similar looking at discharge compliance. So mainly in metal finishing and electronics manufacturing, looking at they want to remove just these specific metals from the waste streams to meet their uh, environmental regulation of permits. So not only is it a uh, little cost, because we're targeting just the metals removed and not everything else. Um, and also these are higher pure metal streams when typical solutions, you get a lot of, of other sludge, non-metal based stuff in the sludge so that the recyclers don't like it. So the smelters don't like it. We can get uh, better purity, higher metal content in, in this byproducts. And so lastly, looking at you know, products, trying to purify these product streams. Um, for example, here on the left, looking at a copper sulfate supplier to the electronics manufacturing, uh, they had a challenge of having small amounts of parts per billion silver in their copper sulfate product that they wanted removed. We were able to remove this very selectively without touching their copper. So now it's improving the value of their own product, similar in the battery second space, removing trace impurities from very complicated streams. And with that, um, I'd be happy to answer questions. Looking back to the chat box. Um, yes, I believe uh, as Charles mentioned, we will have uh, a copy of this recording on the YouTube channel. And if there's anything you know, more specific, we can follow up later and I can give you some versions of the presentation. The question is, do the metals have to be in ionic form or other forms as well. I'm thinking of salts, adsorbed metals. Uh, they have to be dissolved. And by being dissolved in the water, they tend to be ionic. 
if you have things like uh, chelated, they're not finishing, or things that are bound to cyanide, uh, we can still remove those because they're still dissolved. It, it's just maybe a little more challenging of what voltage we have to use to rip them out of that um, matrix. If they are absorbed on a physical material, say like a ceramic or a carbon, then we might be able to filter them just as a particle filter, but that would not be economical for us. We'd like them to be completely dissolved in the water. Uh, how low the sulfate could be removed? Uh, not sure I understand the quite question there, uh, but we're not removing the sulfates, we're removing the metals from uh, you know, sulfate saturated solutions. And the actual concentration of the TDS doesn't really impact us as long as you're not too dilute to be resistive. So anywhere from you know tens to hundreds of ppm in total salts to 100,000 plus TDS, we can still function in. Can the crutches be recharged or reused? Uh, depending on what is it. If they get clogged with some particulates, then yes, we can back flush them, they're good. Uh, but think of this more like a battery. Um, and eventually the electrodes will be completely disintegrated or destroyed and no longer usable. So that's why we use carbon because they are low cost. So the idea is once they are at end of life, the electrodes are no longer can be functional. So they can be disposed of as a non has landfill or recycled as you know, burned in a furnace. Uh, so look at the maximum load of metal per cartridge. Um, so we're looking at around uh, for standard industrial size cartridge getting uh, you know, about half a gram to gram of metals per gram of electrode we use, which relates to about um, a couple hundred grams to kilogram, depending on the metal species we create per cartridge. But once it loads up that way, and if our electrodes are still good, we're able to do a regen cycle. So we can reverse the potentials, do an acid flush, depending on what metal species we create, to then recover these metals into a concentrate and then reuse our electrodes again. Now, as mentioning for the, the minimum conductivity necessary, uh, we'd like to be definitely in the couple hundred microsiemens. So tap water conductivity is good. If we're below that, we can still do it. It just takes uh, higher voltages, so a little more energy to do it. It's a little more challenging. But we've done stuff as low as, I think, like you know, in the 10, 20 total PPM range, so you know, 10 microsiemens of uh, water. And the pH range applicable is going to be dependent upon what metals you want. Uh, certain metal clusters like certain ranges. So for things like copper, silver, gold, we like to be acidic. We can also do it in neutral to so slightly alkaline water. Uh, we tend to like to operate for most things in whatever the discharge pH range is, assuming you're doing this for discharge appliance, so it's already done. Uh, if you have some other niche applications such as product purification or recovery, then we can tune what pH you want. But for the most, it's going to be outside of copper, silver, gold in the four to seven range is sweet spot. Some can go higher, some can go lower. No question on what to use to, to concentrate. Uh, it's more of a back flush from our system. So all the metals are trapped into our carbon electrode matrix. We will essentially do a stop flow, push these metals off of our electrodes and then flush it out. So you get a very concentrated solution. We can do this in a batch mode to start with, say, a pure, you know, maybe uh, sulfuric acid, dilute sulfate water, and concentrate it to, you know, 10, 20,000 ppm copper sulfate that you can use for downstream processing. Uh, the current density is, we're talking, we're very low. So the question is, what current density is used? Uh, we typically operate between 0.4 to 2 volts. And our currents, you know, most applications would be in the 10 to 20 amp range. Some go as high as 35 to 50. So it's very, very low power overall. And we're sitting about a 500 grams to a kilogram of carbon. So if you're familiar with any kind of electrochemistry, chloroalkali, or these DSAs, we're in very, very low current densities compared to that. We're talking, you know, a couple amps per square meter. Uh, at worst case, like 100 amps per uh, square meter of, of electromaterial. So we've got a question on, for discharge compliance, do we just arsenic? So the arsenic, selenium, antimony uh, are challenging because they do not have any insoluble species, these oxoanions. But we have had, had success in doing sort of a combined hybrid process um, by being able to convert these species into more reactive versions to be able to have them precipitate with iron. 
and working on doing this all in situ inside of a reactor, or worst case, we could do it in a combined process where instead of having to add chemicals to reduce, say, selenium arsenic to a reactive state and then adding iron, uh, we can do that internally and then just let it settle after our cell. So it's possible, but they are more challenging and the specific stream will have to be uh, investigated. Okay, um, so that's all the questions that I had in the chat box. Okay, uh, Cameron, I did get a, a question on the private chat. And, and the question was, um, what volume of sample size do you need? And, and how do you prefer to have those samples packaged for delivery to, to your, your labs? So if it's not a really complicated stream, you know, five gallons is more than enough. We require uh, two liters uh, minimum to the process. If it's a known stream panel before, that's fine. If it's a completely new stream to us, we'd like to be able to have more volume, um, such as like five gallons, to be able to look at different voltages, different flow rates, different iterations of our uh, how we do electrodes to, to play around. And we can actually ship out these UN compliant containers. We just fill up your sample. Uh, the shipping is all prepaid. And you just fill it up, put a lid on, and FedEx or other shipper will come uh, collect it and deliver it to us. Uh, only thing we ask for if you do have any kind of cyanide or HF uh, or anything that will produce gases and maybe uh, cause an explosion hazard, need to be uh, known before because those require specific labeling. Other than that, we can take care of the labeling and the, the shipping. Okay. There's another question in the chat box, um, Cameron, if you know, just let me address that question. Yeah, so any removal of anions. Uh, so we do not traditionally look at what we consider traditional TDS. So things like chloride, sulfate, phosphate, calcium, sodium, magnesium, potassium, we don't touch those. Those all go right through our system. We only look at the metals. So traditional uh, transition metals, heavy metals, deep block metals, some metalloids and some non-metals. Um, we like these arsenic, selenium type applications. So for all the traditional TDS salts, we don't touch. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, let's give it another minute or so. Um, maybe uh, while we're waiting for questions, Cameron, in terms of just maybe wrapping it all up, uh, how would you sort of summarize the value proposition that uh, Electromat is bringing to the table? Mm. So the core value we've seen is the automation, right? So this is remote accessible. It doesn't require a lot of user input, especially when you have these very remote locations, uh, not a lot of power and hard to get. You can access everything by a computer as long as you have any kind of Wi-Fi. Uh, LTE, 4G, cellular connection, um, don't need to have interaction. Outside of replacing the filters every you know, one to six months, depending on the application, you let it be. Um, we have all the sensors that can track and tell you pressure drops, pressure buildups, voltage, current profiles, water volume being treated. So all the bells and whistles are there. So if it's working, you're good, you'll know. If something is kind of get out of whack, alarms will go off and that's when you show up. So you don't need to have the, the personal day-to-day -to, -day to be there. Second, it is extremely selective, right? So you don't have to pay to remove, recover other stuff that you don't necessarily want, just those metals. Say for example, RO gets everything out of the water. Um, ion exchange gets you know, usually the same valence. So if you want copper, it might also get calcium with it. All right, so we have a question. Somebody missed the initial part. Um, yes, we brought a copy again. And how does it differ from electrodialysis? So electrodialysis is just looking at those salts. I was talking about the calcium, the magnesium. Um, it will also target some of the charged metals, but not selective. It doesn't matter what it is. If it has a charge, say positive charge, it go towards the one side of the electrodes. It has a negative charge towards the other. Whereas we are not doing some of this charge-based process, purely Faradaic reactions of converting a metal to a metal oxide or to metal hydroxide. Thank you. All right, thank you, thank you for that, Cameron. Okay, uh, to all our guests from uh, around the world that have joined us, thank you so much for coming on the call. And uh, you know, we certainly look forward to giving you a copy of that recording so that you can uh, re-listen to Cameron. Mm -hmm. And if you'd like any other information on Electromat, please don't hesitate to contact Semi, and we'll be more than glad to forward you on to Cameron and his team. Again, thank you very much for attending this webinar. We look forward to seeing mm -hmm. you at our next event. Yep. Thank you. And Charles, if you like, I can send you a PDF version of the presentation. So yes. people ask specifically, they can have that as well. Exactly. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, everybody have a good day. Good afternoon. Thanks, everyone.